Hi there, everyone. My name is Morgan Newhart, and I'm really excited to be here today in whatever sense I can be. I'm currently getting my master's degree in literary, cultural, and textual studies at the University of Central Florida. And today I'm going to be talking about the haunted house as the tortured feminine body. Um, as an essential bit of Gothic literature, the haunted house maintains a really important power throughout horror today and yesterday. From the house that holds secrets in the wallpaper, like in the yellow wallpaper, to the house with ghost girls knocking on the windows, as in Wuthering Heights, and to the states that hold family trauma and secrets deep within their walls, like in The Haunting of Hill House and We Have Always Lived in the Castle. The female protagonists of these stories that I'm going to be focusing on center their lives around these haunted houses and hold the living at a distance, some by choice and others not so much. I argue that the women writers mentioned in this paper use the haunted house trope in order to relay the torture and terror of being a feminine and mentally ill body in the Victorian era and in contemporary times. First, I'm going to be focusing on Wuthering Heights, um, Emily Bronte's story written in the 1840s. It's a stunning ghost tale that holds a special place in Gothic feminist literary achievements. And um, Wuthering Heights, the home itself, is full of disorder. And in this instance of a haunted house, it seems as if the nature outdoors is haunted, trying to pry its way into the home. Catherine as a character is also a bit disorderly, at least not fitting to what is required of a good domestic Victorian woman. And thus her childhood home reflects this aspect of her, of her sense. Um, the truly ghostly bit of the novel, the part that I'm really gonna be focusing on while talking about this, today um, is when we see go Catherine in her ghostly form on the outside of the home reaching through a window and opening to find her way back in. Um, Bronte writes on page 25, as it spoke, I discerned obscurely a child's face looking through the window. Terror made me cruel and finding it useless to attempt shaking the creature off, I pulled its wrist onto the broken pane and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. Still it wailed, let me in. The window itself in this, uh, in this portion is a passageway from one world to the next, from the feminine nature outside to the masculine indoors. This stands out as a different sort of um, image from other stories of the time or even stereotypes of the 1840s for women are meant to be in charge of the household, the domestic leader rather than the man. Why is it then that Catherine is refused entrance to supposedly her own domain? Catherine is, I, I think it's because Catherine is a woman who does not immediately follow those rules on how to be a lady in the mid-19th century. So the home is certainly not her domain and she's limited to the outdoors. It's interesting though, despite being outdoors, she's, she's still under so much masculine control, something one would think she's escaped by not being restrained indoors. Um, scholar Access Me on page 29 of their work writes, so whether the target of the war is a woman, nature, or property makes little difference to men. Nature and home are gendered as female and thus should be subdued into man's service. So in this instance of a haunted home, one can hardly consider the home the prison of the woman, but rather an escape, an understanding of what she could have had she behaved properly according to Victorian standards. Catherine is and essentially chaos and thus as Mitchell writes on page 61 another scholar they write the object in the gothic landscape it is wild untamed and uncontrollable much like the hysterical woman herself Catherine in life and as we see later in death fits the hysteric hysterical woman trope and the nature she inhabits almost inhabits her Wuthering Heights is a haunted home but the outside of it is even more so Catherine belongs among the ghosts and cannot survive if she must be inside, as a previous quote mentioned, also by Mitchell, page 58, the only escape was either death or madness. Once Catherine dies, she's buried on the moors, her sanctuary, Bronte writes on page 170. The place of Catherine's interment to the surprise of the villagers was neither in the chapel under the carved monument of the Lintons, nor yet by the tombs of her own relations outside. I won't get entirely into the chaos of where the men in her life desire to be buried, nor the upheaval Heathcliff does of her body, but these moments do show men intruding on a woman's comfort and safe space, disrespecting her even after her death. Catherine cannot escape the strife of life as a woman in the 19th century, and yet as she tries to do so, her body is destroyed, and she must find her way among the haunted house and land as a ghost herself. 
The trauma Catherine faces as a woman of her time, both in life and death, creates the overfounding image of her connection with the house and the land as a feminine body. There's quite a lot to speak about when it comes to the haunting of Catherine Earnshaw Linton, and yet, despite the wild nature of the woman, she faces a life as a Victorian lady. She cannot escape it no matter the constraints in her home, those that are not entirely present even. Um, Catherine is a ghost at the end and beginning of the novel, and while terrifying to see her specter at the window, she's not the only ghost of the Victorian era. era. <laughs> Every woman forced to become a proper lady is a ghost in her own right. Um, and then, so we're jumping forward a few years, 50 years or so, in 1892 to Charlotte Perkins Gilman's short story, gothic short story, The Yellow Wallpaper. Um, the story follows a narrator who's stuck inside her holiday home, attempting to heal from an unnamed illness. They go to this home in order to heal. That's, that's, the, um, that's the main um, plot of the story. And so the home actually haunts her as much as she haunts the living around her. The hus her husband and sister-in-law's lack of belief in the protagonist's illness and pain perhaps is the most disturbing bit of the story perhaps even more so than that moving wallpaper. Scholar Gandarion writes about the 19th century woman and the text and this text in particular on page 126 of their work. They say, consequently, a typical 19th century middle-class housewife would be seen as a desperate attention seeker who acts just as irrationally and sentimentally as a spoiled infant to be the center of attention. And her serious case of nervous breakdown would be viewed as trivial. At the beginning of this story, the author, the narrator feels herself to be a ghost Perhaps this is part of the constraints she feels of being forced to go away and stay within that nursery for far too long of an extended amount of time. Immediately, as if she's connected to the holiday home, and I argue she is, she notices the feeling of something strange. As the narr narrator says on page 180, that spoils my ghostliness, I'm afraid, but I don't care. There's something strange about this house. I can feel it. The house with all its maladies holds something for the narrator, a feeling, a ghostliness. She changes in this home, her mental health draining with each moment stuck inside. Her madness only grows as she continues to stay inside. And again, no one believes this hysteria and this pain she's going through. Whether or not there is a woman within the wallpaper is really irrelevant at this moment, as her husband didn't believe her before this, um, the moving lady was even mentioned and doesn't believe her while this vision is happening. Feminist disability studies are a helpful tool to fully understand what is going on here. Generally, women are cast as capable of enduring more pain as a sign. This is um, from Shepard, Scholar Shepard on page 56 of their work. They say, generally women are cast as capable of enduring more pain as assigned female bodies have the capacity to go through childbirth, but also as being more inclined to complain about minor pains and tending towards hysteria. Essentially, this is kind of saying that the lack of understanding and belief from doctors and family alike leads to an alienation of women and their health. And so it's kind of stepping away from this mental prison that the narrator is, all, is in, the house is also considered a prison as well. The wallpaper especially works with metaphors and rhythms that could only be described as prison-like. Gilman writes on page 189 of the book, of the story, at night in any kind of light, in twilight, candlelight, lamplight, and worst of all, by moonlight, it becomes bars. She's talking about the wallpaper here. The narrator sees this home as a prison and it's bleeding into her mental state. Each moment that passes, she feels more and more imprisoned. There's quite literally no escape for her. A lack of belief in women, as well as the hysteria that continues to grow every second she spends in that draining home, means there's nothing for the narrator outside the constraints of this home. But is it the constraints of the home she means to escape truly? Mitchell also writes on page 58, the Female characters of these novels did not seek to escape from a rambling old mansion or a supernatural force, but rather from their own lives and bodies. For many, the only escape was either death or madness. She, in fact, goes mad and continues to go mad. The story ends with her madness leeching into her, onto her husband and the rest of the home. Her escape is sorrowful and unfortunately not unlike many others, uh, other women's stories. Um, and so now I'm going to be jumping a little bit further to a different time period and even to a different um, country. Um, I'm going to be looking at Shirley Jackson's two novels, two, two of just Shirley Jackson's novels um, from the mid-20th century American Gothic. Um, and it's incredible how they still connect and there's still so much I want to share about these stories, despite not being exactly in the Victorian time. So these two novels, The Haunting of Hill House 
and we have always lived in the castle are about women with familial trauma and the homes that both haunt them and inhabit them. In Hill House, Eleanor goes to the unsettling titular home and strangely finds herself at peace and present in the moment more so than she ever has in her small life. Dealing with the trauma of her mother, mother's death and the days leading up to her mother's death, Eleanor leaves her old home to go to this new one in order to find herself in a way. Besides not saying that explicitly, that's what the reader gains from this. And she does find herself here at Hill House. On page 25 of Jackson's novel, she writes, Hill House came around her in a rush. She was enshadowed and the sound of her feet on the wood of the veranda was an outrage in the utter silence. At this moment, Hill House feels like it's capturing her soul in a single moment. She's found where she belongs and it happens almost immediately. Her comfort is found within this home, sleeping well, she sleeps well, she eats well, she socializes well, better than she ever has anywhere else. And it's odd because it's a haunted home and no one else can relate to these feelings. And yet maybe Eleanor's desire to be a part of something, a part of a home, a family is found within Hill House, a way to escape her trauma that she's faced like over years and years of her entire life. The supernatural bearing of this home seems to have enthralled her. As a single older woman, she does not fit where the patriarchy wants and thus finds it elsewhere in an old, out of the way image of pure domesticity. Scholar Christine Junker writes about how important the house itself is to Eleanor. She says on page nine, I interpret the significance of this house in the narrative as both a representation of Eleanor's psychological longing to create a sense of belonging and also a reflection of desire akin to that of, akin to that ex expressed by Freeman's work. To have an idolized domestic space that simultaneously enables and preserves feminine identity and autonomy and the concurrent anxiety that such space is impossible within patriarchy. The domestic space of the house, no matter how creepy and unsettling it is, is still just that, a domestic image. Eleanor longs for domesticity and yet can never achieve it. That is until she, she lives forever now at Hill House. She dies on Hill House's property and is now a part of this home for eternity. Will she haunt these halls? I think so. I think she longs for a home and found it there. And so now she's there forever. Previously, in the beginning of the novel, as soon as she walks in, her soul was inhabited by Hill House. And in the end, her body also becomes part of Hill House through a traumatic, it's extremely traumatic. And here she is, she's there forever now. And so now moving on to We Have Always Lived in the Castle, Mary Cat and her older sister Constance are two agoraphobic young women. After the murder of their parents and the acquittal of Constance for this murder, the girls never leave their home, their castle. The home is a safety net for the two of them. Each moment they spend inside, while horrifying at times when remembering the deaths of their parents and aunt right at the dining room table, feels it their time inside still feels right. The reader is led to believe how much this home protects those women, despite its haunted nature. Jackson writes on page 120, Constant, Constance waited just inside the front door while I went onto the porch again and closed the shutters over the tall dining room windows. And then I came inside and we shut and locked the front door and we were safe. Protection in the home can almost be related to the safety that women find in domesticity, but in this text, it does not come across this way. While Constance feels like a put together, proper Victorian woman, her anxieties and mental illness stop her from being perfectly domestic. The house, this home is, is something else altogether in the text, a haunted space they inhabit. And even when it burns down towards the end of the novel, they find peace within it. Jackson takes a lot of influences from Gothic novels of the past when it, came, when it comes to the writing of this haunted home. Um, scholar Maytick writes on page 407, it is in accordance with this dynamic that the house, one of the key Gothic and horror tropes, ceases to be a home, a place of safety and becomes instead an oppressive claustrophobic space and the nexus of secrets, sins, and crimes. I think this is a really great point, but I also argue that in Castle, in Castle, um, the women use this claustrophobic space to create their own sort of safety. They define their own safety and it looks a little different from others because of their unseen disabilities and trauma. The way Maricat and Constance go about living feels different from other young women of their age. And while yes, the town sees them as strange, a term that frankly denies them accessibility for them, they find peace in their own haunted home. 
the rest of the world is haunted for them and thus they must stay inside, constrained by their own doing as the world fears them. And so now, yeah, that's, those are all the ones that I wanted to cover. Um, each of these novels shares such a different aspect of the haunted home and each story tells the tale of a woman in peril and somehow her home is always at the core of it, which I found so interesting. Um, the yellow wallpaper shares how a home meant for healing cannot heal if those in, if there are those in pain and, and they're not believed. Weathering Heights shows how important a window is for a perfectly good haunting from the wild world outdoors. Shirley Jackson's novels elaborate each in their own way on the home as a family, a safe space, despite the trauma and suffering. By using theories of disability studies, particularly that of Rosemary Garland Thompson's, as she writes on page five, it addresses feminist, um, feminist disability studies, addresses feminist concerns like the category of women, the status of the lived body, the politics of appearance, the medicalization of the body, etc. One can see how the women characters of these texts feel unprotected and othered. The haunting story of how women are expected to persevere through trauma and suffering is how each one is connected. The homes, whether you believe in ghosts or not, are haunted by the past and the present of how women and their mental health are rejected and belittled. And yeah, that's everything. Thank you so much for having me. This has been lovely. Um, thank you. Have a great have a great rest of the conference. I wanted to add in one more thing. Here are my sources. Um, these are the images from the PowerPoint, but as well, here are my paper sources. Um, thanks again for letting me be a part of this. Thank you.